Orthographic mapping. How do children become fluent readers and writers? Well, it starts with the sight word vocabulary. This doesn't mean, though, that they should be given a set of sight words to memorize. That's inefficient and it doesn't help them spell those words later. Instead, they build up a store of words they can recognize effortlessly without sending them out and without looking elsewhere for cues. In fact, once they have a word in their sight word vocabulary, they can't suppress its sound and possible meanings when they come to that word again. So saying that children shouldn't learn whole words for memorization sounds counterintuitive. And in fact, I have to apologize when I ask teachers not to do this because many of them spend hours and years even sending home sight words for memorization with the best intentions. But please don't shoot the messenger. A popular thought is that input and output should be equal. So we speak in whole words, why not input whole words? I'm afraid that doesn't work. Let's break it down and put it into perspective. As a literate adult, how many words and word parts do you think you might instantly recognize? Kilpatrick puts it as somewhere between 30 and 70,000. Now my question to you is, did you consciously memorize each one as a whole? Or did you store them in a different way? It would be impossible to consciously memorize this many words. What you actually did was use a process called orthographic mapping. Let's break it down. Ortho means correct or straight, such as in orthodontist or orthopedic. Graph, that which is written. And mapping, matching one representation to another. This diagram is intended to show the relationship between orthography, the spelling of something, M-A-P-P-I-N-G, and how that maps onto phonology, m a p i n and then how that's stored in the lexicon, mapping. Here's the process. What you do is you look at the sequence of the letters in a word, then you translate them into possible phonemes when you're reading, you blend those phonemes to form words, and then through exposure, those sequences become unitized, leading to instant recognition. Some estimates put it at one to four exposures for typically developing readers. This in turn facilitates recall when writing. But the big question is, how come some children do learn sight words using flashcards? Well, because it's possible. It's possible to memorize whole words as wholes without sounding them out. But it's not possible to memorize all the words like that. If you want to be efficient and you want to reach as many children as possible, teach them to sound words out. This will help them learn new words and it will also help them to spell words. At this point, we should talk about Linnea Airy. Most of her research looked at the way that children moved from learning to recognize words to self-teaching and she came up with the term orthographic mapping to describe this phenomenon. Here are her key findings. Firstly, children who have good knowledge of grapheme phoneme correspondences can retain words in their long-term memory with more efficiency than those who don't. Therefore, it's logical to teach these systematically from school entry. Another of her findings was that underpinning this proficiency is phonemic awareness. That's the ability to perceive the sameness, number, order and difference of sounds in the speech stream. Therefore, Assessing and intervening from school entry helps everybody. And thanks to David Kilpatrick's work, it's not hard. Next, Airy found that the crucial part of the kind of memorization we're talking about is attention to the sequence of letters in a word. Therefore, instruction that interferes with sequential observation, like whole words or the psycholinguistic guessing game, interferes with permanent storage. Aries' research also showed that this builds cumulatively and eventually results in seemingly effortless decoding of familiar and, more importantly, unfamiliar or irregular words. This is where Cher's self-teaching hypothesis comes in. And as Alison Clark from Spelphabet said, things tie together when you have a really good theory. Let's look at Cher's self-teaching hypothesis. In my practice, when children have had enough exposure to the alphabetic code, enough practice in blending and segmenting words and putting them together, they start to read. At first, this can be slow and laboured. But as they get more practice, they get more proficient. And that's what I call the sweet zone, when they start to teach themselves. 
Scherer's self-teaching hypothesis proposes that phonological recoding functions as a self-teaching mechanism, enabling the learner to independently acquire an autonomous orthographic lexicon. Let's look at that a bit closer. Phonological recoding is the ability to read from left to right unfamiliar words. It's the ability to generate sounds for the letters and letter combinations. And it's the ability to blend sounds into recognisable words. So without direct instruction in every word, those whose phonological and orthographic foundations are strong enough use those foundations to self-teach. And before you know it, you're at 30,000 plus words by the time you're all grown up. That's what Cher means by building your autonomous orthographic lexicon. I see this poster or a version of this poster on school walls everywhere. My students get sent home with these pictures and prompts on laminated pieces of card. Some prompts are more useful than others, but what I'd like you to do is take a minute and ask yourselves, which prompts are likely to facilitate orthographic mapping? Which prompts aren't? And then the big question is, why teach with prompts that don't facilitate orthographic mapping? We're going to play look away bingo. Firstly, let's take a look at eagle eye. It says, look at the picture. Think, what is in the picture that starts with the beginning letter? Does that facilitate orthographic mapping? Is that asking a student to look at the sequence of the letters? No. How about lips the fish? Get your mouth ready, say the beginning sound. Well, that's all fine, but what about the other sounds? Stretchy snake. Slowly stretch each letter sound to make the word. Looks like we actually have something that might be useful. Let's move on to Chunky Monkey. Chunky Monkey, break the word into chunks you already know. M at, f l at, sp l at er. The implication here is that somehow the word at has something to do with the other words. That's some pretty dangerous morphology there. Not recommended. Try and lion. Try to reread the sentence. Think, what makes sense? In terms of look away bingo, that's another prompt to look away from the word. Skippy frog. Skip the tricky word. Read to the end. Go back and try it again. Hmm. Look away again. Flippy dolphin. Flip the vowel sound. Try the long and short sounds. Not bad, but in the absence of a rationale as to why you would do that, doesn't seem to make sense. That last bit, always makes sense, sound right, look right, I've got a special counter for. I've no idea what that's supposed to mean. So out of all these strategies, only two have anything to do with the phonology and the orthography of the word. Everything else is asking the student to look away from the word. If you want to be effective, and more importantly, if you want your students to be proficient readers, Get them to keep their eyes on the word and go through the whole word. If you want to deliberately impair the process of orthographic mapping, then encourage them to guess words by looking away from unfamiliar words.